welcome to the San Diego Zoo and Save the Koala Days. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm here with Onio. He's our hand-raised koala joey. I guess he's not so much a joey anymore because he's about two years old. And he's with our lead wildlife care specialist, Jen. They have a very close relationship and she's doing a great job offering him a little bit of eucalyptus because eucalyptus is what they eat. In fact, it's the only thing that they eat. And if you've got a you got to look at those hands of his. They get the leaves from eucalyptus in the trees, which is where they live. They do everything in the trees. And here at the San Diego Zoo, for Save the Koala Day, you came to the right place because we have got the largest breeding population of koalas outside of Australia. So 30 plus koalas gives San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance a great opportunity to learn about koalas, share with our conservation partners, to help the wild populations in Australia. And Omeo is a testament to that. He had a little rough start when he came out. He was hand raised because we lost his mom, but because we have the expertise here and resources here at the San Diego Zoo, our neonatal care staff, a veterinary service staff, obviously our wildlife care specialists have the expertise to get him to the point where he is thriving now. And that is exactly what we want to be doing here from San Diego Zoo and the Wildlife Alliance. Thank you so much, Lisa. We actually already have a couple questions rolling in, so we'll get started there. Um, do we have any idea why koalas prefer eucalyptus? That's a good question. I, I believe that it's probably due to where they live. Eucalyptus is prevalent there and the forest that they live in and the forest that they live in is all eucalyptus. So it's hard to say why they uh, adapted and grew to like eucalyptus only, but it is certainly where their adaptations lead them to. What do koalas feel like? I mean, their, their fur looks super soft, but is it? That's a really great question. And I'm always surprised to hear people say that it looks for, uh, soft. Actually, I shouldn't be surprised but it's not. It's really kind of woolly and very, very thick. So that helps cushion their bodies when they're sitting in the trees and it keeps them very water resistant as well. So it's really kind of thick and dense. You can see it's a little bit woolly. When you, whoop, where are you going, buddy? <laughs> Use those hands to stay in the trees. <laughs> and we've heard that koalas, uh, while they only eat one thing, they're actually kind of picky. Is that true? They can be. So they eat only one thing, and that one thing is eucalyptus. But there are over 100 kinds of eucalyptus. Now, we don't have 100 kinds of eucalyptus here in San Diego. Our horticulture team has access to maybe 30 plus kinds of eucalyptus. So we do um, change the variety that they get every day and offer it maybe three or four kinds of eucalyptus. And some days they decide the kind we've offered is really not what they want to have. So they do get a little bit picky. Um, you have to remember as well that the eucalyptus we offer, and you're going to see this up close a little bit later, is the tips is really all that they like to eat. This is where all the nutrients are. This is where the moisture is. And the rest of it, really, they don't pay too much yeah. attention to. <laughs> are you finished with us, buddy? Hi. <laughs> Let's see if Got we can get a weight on him. Let's see what his weight is. Oh, yeah, Dude, TikTok, do you guys want to guess how much you think Omeo probably weighs? He's what, a little over two years old. He just celebrated his second birthday. Any guesses so Any far? Any guesses? <laughs> Here we go. How much do you weigh, bud? We're going to say 13.5 pounds. 13.5 pounds. Is that pretty average for a male koala? That is, um, especially because he needed a little bit of help when he was growing up. So he's one of the um, smaller males, but he is of a healthy weight. Yes. Perfect for a two-year-old. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Omeo's amazing backstory? Well, he's, as I had mentioned before, we got our hands on him when he was about five months old because his mother passed away from cancer when he was still a pouched young. So he was still not able to care for himself, thermoregulate, that means, you know, keep his temperature um, healthy, um, and certainly depended on his mother for milk. So when she passed away, we reached out to our neonatal care staff and our veterinary services staff, and a lot of the wildlife care specialists 
have experience with young uh, koalas, either here or maybe even in Australia. Um, and so it was very long process and there were hills and valleys in his hair that he has become at that one year mark. We thought that we were doing very well for him and he was too. So when we lost his mom, we were able to hand raise him, do bottle feedings, and eventually get him to eat eucalyptus like all koalas do. And I'm going to backtrack. So we might have seen him really smelling the um, handles and the cart right here. And that's because koalas have a really good sense of smell. He was smelling all of the other koalas that had been here before he was. Yes, the sense of smell is really important for koalas. It, not, they communicate through senses of smell as well. He's a little boy and he's got the scent gland over here on his chest. In the wild, all the koala males would scent gland, scent mark the trees to let other koalas know where they have been and where the other males should not be. <laughs> it's very important. They can tell when each other. All right. Show off where the females live. Absolutely. Yep. Time for him to go over. Let's go check out the ladies. Absolutely. Follow Mr. Omeo and Come on, we will Omeo, where are we going? To where the ladies live. Also, I gotta say, I'm so impressed with the chat right now. You guys are killing it with the koala puns. You <laughs> understood the assignment. Good job. And we're looking at Omeo's hands right here, and it looks like he's got, what is that, two thumbs? That's exactly right, right? They, they're very close together. That helps them live in the trees, which is where they do everything koalas do. So he's going to introduce us to the harem yard, which is where all the girls live. All the ladies. That's right, all the girls. If he was um, younger, he might still be able to be here. But because he's over a year and a half now, he would not be living in the harem with the girls. So he's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing as a young male koala. Woo. All right, we're going to go see some ladies. Yes. Let's do it. Thank you, Omeo. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks, Omeo. Yeah. All right. Here we have Jenny Rosler. She is uh, one of our senior wildlife care specialists. And she's out here doing what they do every day for a koala colony. We need to get our eyes on them. And she's really great at identifying them, much better than I. Important for her to be here. Yeah. <laughs> but she is going to be trying to feed eucalyptus to all of the koala girls out here. And we have a couple that are living in the trees as part of the habitat. Let's see if we can find her. Hello. This is Wanaroo. Monaroo. Hi, Monaroo. And Wanaroo actually has a joey in the pouch. <gasps> she's a joey. So uh, she's not that far along. She's about three, four months, but we've been seeing a lot of movement. So you might see the pouch kind of move at times. Uh, the Joey's been moving around, probably nursing. But this is Wanaru's favorite spot. She likes to hang out, like, down here. But she also has a companion above her, and that is Marinda. Oh, I almost little, missed her. Yeah, they like to hide out. We call this the playground. Um, it's one of an Australian species of plant. It's called a Melaleuca. And the girls like to move about the habitat and actually just sit around this uh, particular species of bush and uh and just kind of hang out because they do that many hours in a day they hanging out <laughs> they split yeah they hang out they're out here 24 7 but you might see our koalas sleep in a good 18 to 20 hours a day uh mornings are probably the best time if you get an opportunity to stop by the zoo stop by the koalas first thing <laughs> and you might see some uh actually activity um but the girls are gonna sleep then till uh, the sun starts to set, and then they'll wake up again. It's a lot of sleeping. About. A lot of sleeping. I want to sleep like that. <laughs> so Miranda's on the move, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and give a bundle of eucalyptus to Wanaru and see if we can actually get her to eat. She's probably quite hungry, and she has that Joey in the pouch, and she's looking over our way like she you really want wants it. That would be the bundle, Lisa. How often do you change out the bundles of eucalyptus? It's changed out every morning. Every morning. Uh, and sometimes if the koalas have been eating quite a bit, then we will uh, come back through and give additional eucalyptus. But usually once a day, 
seems to be plenty for these guys. Of course, they only want those tender tips, those first eight to 10 inches of leaves. That's where they get all of their moisture. Well, hi. Wow. Oh, and see, we've actually got a really great point. It's um, a myth about koalas, potentially. Um, would you touch on, it seems like everybody thinks all koalas have chlamydia. I have heard this before too. And it's not incorrect that koalas can contract chlamydia. You're not gonna find chlamydia in any of the populations like here at San Diego Zoo or any of the other organizations that we uh, collaborate with. It is a, a, an affliction that wild populations will sometimes contract and it is contagious. So if one koala contracts it in the wild, it's very possible that it can be spread to other koalas. So it's not something that you're going to find here and it's not something that we protect ourselves from here Definitely. at the San Diego Zoo. And can you confirm or deny whether or not a baby koala is the size of a jelly bean? Uh, well, you know, when they're first born, they are. So Ginny talked about Wanneroo's Joey in the pouch. That Joey has been in the pouch much longer than a newborn Joey. Koalas, when they're born, are about the size of a jelly bean, and it's their job to climb from the birth canal up the mother's stomach to the pouch where they will attach to a nipple inside that pouch. And that's where they stay for five to seven months. So that's why it's important for the keeper, the specialist to recognize when there's pouch movement and know that we're getting close to maybe seeing some signs of emergence. They don't just pop out of the pouch, right? It's not a jack in the box, <laughs> but they will stick hands out, limbs out, maybe even poke a nose and face out. And that's why it's so important for the wildlife care specialist to be this close to the koalas as we work with them on a daily basis. Fantastic. So this isn't the only uh, part of the habitat um, that we keep our koalas. We actually have um, more space here with our females. And from what I've been told from the other specialists, we've got koalas on the move on the other side. Oh, koalas so on the move. we can actually go see if we can see koalas moving. Can let Lana Rue have her breakfast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, we can certainly come back to her. Um, I know that Marinda was hanging out with her. Yeah. So uh, you might actually see uh, some more activity from Marinda. Okay. Oh, oh yes. this is one of our young ones. This is Hi there. But her mother is actually Kularu, who's moving about, sampling all of the eucalyptus that we've put out this morning to see which one she would prefer for the day. And once they find what they like, they will usually sit there and consume those tender tips for maybe a good 20 to 30 minutes, it depends. But we have some koalas who like to go from, as we call canister to canister, and that's what we call uh, where the eucalyptus is uh, kind of sitting like in a vase. And um, they will sometimes go canister to canister to see which ones they really prefer. Much like they would do in the trees in, in the forests of Australia, right? Same thing in Australia. But in Australia, sometimes they have to go way up high in those trees. So they might go up and spend a day or two, but then come down to the ground and move to another tree. They are very pampered here <laughs> at the zoo and they get between three and four different species of eucalyptus on a daily basis. So you might actually see that the leaves look different. And that's because we get, we have access to some of the varieties and species of eucalyptus. Not as many as exist. She's so small. She's so small, hello. <laughs> so Wendy here is only a year and a half of age and Koalas are independent at a, at a, at a year, about, a, about 12 months. Uh, so that's when they're actually weaned and will fully be on eucalyptus. So she's been on her own for probably a good eight months. There's that little face. There it is. She's one of our cutest. She's very precious. Got that teddy bear face, but they aren't bears, right? They're not bears. They are a marsupial. The females do have pouches, and that's where they carry their young, just like what Rana grew on the other side. Her joey is in that pouch. The muscles around that pouch are very tight, and that's what keeps that joey inside. Uh, so when the koalas are bouncing around or moving about the enclosure, 
Oh, we got and one we on got, the move. We got Speaking her of. Again. And if you see that pouch, it's kind of sagging there. That's because <laughs> Kuinda has a brother or sister on the way. Oh That's my what? goodness. That's so exciting. And so we saw Omeo being weighed earlier. The specialists weigh all of the koalas once a week so that we can monitor whether or not they're gaining or losing weight. And you can guess that she is probably gained weight since she's got that joey in the pouch. It tends to happen. It will. It happens to the best of us. Sure right? does. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about those little strangely shaped noses? Those noses are bare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're actually quite large and that's because they need to smell the eucalyptus. Um, they really rely on their sense of smell and their sense of hearing. Their eyesight is not as keen. So that's what she's gonna use when she goes to these different canisters. Is she's gonna actually use that nose to sniff the different species. So she can select what she really wants to eat. And right now she's just showing off how she moves about in her habitat and uses those two thumbs to really grasp the tree to get up and down and to move about. Absolutely. So and I guess she didn't want anything on this side. Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right, let's see if we can go visit. Hi. Which one she might select. Hello. She looks very surprised to see us today. <laughs> She's probably going, did you bring more? Yeah. Awesome. Are these my choices today? Are these my choices? Do, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the sound that koalas make? <laughs> the sound that they make is called a bellow, and it's very hard for me to do. Um, it's very guttural. So it has to um, go quite a, quite a ways for another animal to hear. So uh, our females will do it when they're ready for breeding so they can call to the males and the males will actually call back and they can find them. Um, males, when they sense that there is a female or another male nearby, will actually do a bellow. Your best bet is to go um, onto YouTube and put in koala bellow. <laughs> and that's the best version of a koala bellow you'll hear. And you will be surprised to, to hear that sound and relate it to such a small animal. I know the first time I heard it, I was incredulous that that loud sound came from this small animal. And both the girls and boys do it, like Jenny said. Oh, well, bathroom break. Yeah, potty break. Yep, potty break happens. Just I know. With every, yep. with every other pregnant... Yep. <laughs> yep. Can only hold so much. She's a mom. Only so much. <laughs> got to do what you got to do. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys all so much for donating, by the way, because it is Save the Koala Day, and they are in need of our help. Um, Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on with koalas in the wild? Well, I think the most recent thing that we've been able to participate and contribute to in the wild with koalas was the wildfires that happened in 2020. We had an outpouring of uh, support from our donors, our guests, just paying dollars coming through the gate. And of course, the koala enrichment, or excuse me, the koala care program that we have here at the San Diego Zoo. Um, we were able to raise about a million dollars to send to Australia to um, help rescue some of those koalas that were being, um, thrown out of the forest by the fire, provide some water sources for the other animals that also live in those Australian forests. And that money was part of our collaboration with those folks. We were able, we still collaborate with uh, Queensland University, Science for Wildlife. We have a lot of partners that help us to contribute to conservation for koalas. And there are a number of programs that we participate in. I know St. Bees Island is one of the places that we have sent our staff to help them kind of take a census and know what the population of the koalas are there because that's so important to know how they use their environment. Um, who's using the environment? Are they moms and joeys? Are they uh, males? All of that's very important information and we are able to help with that help with the koalas we have here at the zoo. Let's see if we heard Did a little sound. <laughs> and these structures that they're in are called what again? We call these palapas. They serve a really great purpose, right? Shelter from the sun a little bit. They're also equipped for the, uh, I guess you can call it weather here in San Diego, <laughs> right? And when it gets chilly, 
that silver um, lamp you see up there, it's a heater and it's on a thermostat. So when it gets down below 65, 60 degrees, almost 50 to 60 degrees, those kick on for them. We also know that koalas aren't really fond of the heat. You would think they'd be okay having uh, their uh, natural habitat being in Australia, but they don't really care for the heat so much. And these palapas are equipped with misters. So I like to refer to it as koalas in the mist. If you come <laughs> here during a hot day and the misters are on, the koalas benefit from the mist, but so do our guests a little bit, you know, it kind of blows over the pathway, keeps the whole area cool. And that's important for them as well. We've got a couple more questions coming in too. Are koalas solitary animals? They are solitary animals. The only reason that you're gonna see um, the girls living together here is because they're a little more tolerant than the boys. Males are very territorial. So here at the zoo, each male has his own yard with his own palapa. So um, yes, they're solitary animals. That's fantastic. <laughs> Maybe we should let everyone see oh, yeah let's go see some other koalas that sounds great yeah. and we'll answer a couple of questions on our way Absolutely. awesome um will koalas eat leaves by themselves or will they only eat those fresh little leaves that are right off the stem their preference is going to be those little leaves off of the stem but you know if it's a variety that they really like they will actually eat down the stem and the more mature leaves Hi, what are you doing up there, Colette? Oh, that is a grumpy face. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's grumpy Colette. <laughs> that's her resting grumpy face. So I'm so glad that you guys are here for Save the Koala Day because you are witnessing proof positive that koalas do actually move. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody believes us when we no. say that they move around. They here just sleep all the time. But here we go. Case in point, we do move. Now it might be about food, but you know, I'd move for food too. I'd move for food. Right. I do a lot of things for food. <laughs> exactly. Oh, who's this? This is Mayala. Hi, Mayala. Hi. And she's eating. Yep. Stuff. See oh. how she uses? And she reaches over to get those tender tips. Just like the tender tips. Just like the tender tips. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they eat a little farther down. And they have front incisors, those front teeth. Um, and that's what they use to nip the eucalyptus leaves off of the stem and then they'll manipulate it to the back molars to chew it up before they actually swallow. Do they drink water? Does the water just come from the leaves that they eat? Uh, they get most of their moisture from the eucalyptus leaves, but we do offer water bowls in case our koalas want to come down and get a drink. But a majority of the time, all of their moisture is coming from the leaf. Oh, wow. And what kind of natural predators do they have in the wild? Um, natural predator, predators occasionally, if they're in the right spot, maybe a dingo might take a koala. Um, there have been known for large raptors to take young, young joeys. But um, the biggest threat that they face right now is just habitat loss. And as humans are now starting to encroach and live in koala habitat, koalas are losing their, their homes and their food source. So that's why the numbers have decreased. Our domestic animals don't help the process either. You mm -hmm. know, people with people, we have our dogs as, as pets. And so that can also be a threat when the koalas are on the ground. Yeah. And we knew this question was coming. What do koalas smell like? <laughs> Three guesses, eucalyptus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they do have, they smell like what you eat, I guess, when yep. you're a koala. And the males with their scent gland on their chest, you'll notice that the females don't have that dirty spot on their chest because they have a pouch. The males actually will smell a little musky at times. And that's to uh, let other males know that this is their territory. They will rub all of that oil from their chest on the, Ooh, on the perching, on the eucalyptus perching. And that will let the other males know that this is their territory, but also let the girls know how to find them. Sometimes that scent marking is accompanied by that bellow we were talking about, right? Yeah. yeah. I think uh, another reputation that koalas have is for not being the smartest or biggest of brained animals. <laughs> you know, I thought that at times, but they're <laughs> pretty smart. We've well, they, got one over here moving. They know when we're coming. We'll come back. And they make some efforts to, uh, you, they can identify when we come into the yard with them. They know and have expectations 
fine with it. I don't Hi, know Miranda. if I call it small brain. <laughs> they didn't mean it. They didn't mean it. No, don't <laughs> listen to them. Don't listen to the haters. <laughs> And for those of you just joining us, thank you so much. Today is Save the Koala Day. So we're live with our koalas here at the San Diego Zoo. And uh, Lisa, is it correct that this is the only colony of koalas outside of Australia? This is the largest, the largest breeding, koala breeding. Oh. colony outside of Australia. And we are fortunate to have 30 plus koalas now. Oh, wow. Yes, 30 31 plus. adult koalas. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. With many joeys in the pouch. Yes. Stay tuned. It's going to be a busy holiday season <laughs> probably here in the koala habitat. So please come and join us for that day, those days as well. And these are all lady koalas. How can a general viewer tell the difference between a male and a female koala? Males are generally larger in size. Larger in size. Um, and we mentioned the scent glands too. They have that little gray brownish spot on their chest, the males will. And the females don't have that. So um, generally speaking, size uh, is a really good indicator of uh, gender. Well, Ooh. they all have that smooth nose because they both males and females depend on their sense of smell for everything they do, whether it's locating a male located I hear my oh, I, we hear our kookaburra going yes, off she is. well these are her koalas so when we are working in with the koala she wants to make sure that uh, we are aware that she's supervising she's yeah, always <laughs> watching Wazowski always watching. another Australian species. incredible aren't they that's fantastic let's see where'd she go oh big jump there we go that was something that I was very surprised to learn when I started working with koalas is that Yes, they live in trees. They will traverse to the ground to get from tree to tree or from habitat to habitat here. Uh, but they are capable of jumping uh, probably a distance of six feet. Wow. And I did not realize that. I didn't know they could jump either. That's amazing. It is amazing. It's even more amazing when you get to see it, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah. And we have a couple who are just joining us. So they're asking, what, do koala, what does koala fur feel like? Oh, yes. They, it does look like it's soft but it's really more woolly because it's very dense. It keeps them fairly waterproof in the trees. And um, it's also a bit of a cushion when they sit in those perches of the trees and rest, mm -hmm. which they do 18, 20 hours a day. So. That's amazing. Yeah. And they don't make good pets, right? These are wild animals. Of course. These are wild animals. I would not, and I would not recommend having koalas as pets for your house and for the koalas too. <laughs> exactly. I've also had people ask me, why don't we just have koalas living in San Diego? Because there's all these eucalyptus trees. But that is the case. There are eucalyptus trees. We need to remember that there is a preference as far as eucalyptus goes. A lot of the eucalyptus trees that we have here are not a favorite of koalas. So it wouldn't be, we would not be able to sustain wild koalas here. Not to mention the threats that we mentioned before to koalas in Australia also translate to threats here in the United States and California, San Diego as well. Vehicles, domestic pets, um, and the fact that we do have a lot of real estate that we take up as people, right? Nick Bear 11 is curious about the types of eucalyptus that we offer our koalas. We have access to about, I don't know, 30 or species or so. Yeah. Our horticulture team is diligent about delivering our eucalyptus to a cooler that's made for the floral industry but they bring it to us on a daily basis and make sure that we have a lot of eucalyptus to offer through the weekend and they each get about three to four different species or varieties of eucalyptus when we feed them on a daily basis looks like it's nap time for some of these guys <laughs> are we full already i know that happens so quickly and we talked about them eating just the supple tips of the eucalyptus but also know, is there another koala moving around? And eating too. Um, also know that we recycle the eucalyptus that the koalas don't eat. We have other departments like our bird department. We'll sometimes come and take the eucalyptus that the koalas don't eat and use that for, uh, I think they're, they're lorikeets, which is also an Australian species. So nothing goes to waste here at the San Diego Zoo. <laughs> Love that. Uh, about how much do they eat every day? Jenny, is that a... They'll, they'll eat a good pound and a half to two pounds of leaves a day, each koala. Wow. Um, so we go through several hundred pounds daily. 
Um, it feels like we're we're um, uh, getting rid of a lot of it, but as Li Lisa was saying, is a lot of it is enrichment for other animals, um, other Australian species, and then the rest of it is recycled, so it is reused. That's amazing. So um, I we've got a little girl that's uh, moving on the boat, another oh one and a half year old for us to look. Let's at. go see some more koalas. Keep the questions coming, you guys. We're happy to answer them, and happy Save the Koala Day. So glad you came. Yeah, so glad to give you guys the sneak peek into our koala habitats. These again are all of our female koalas. The males live in separate habitats because they're a little more solitary, but we've got some of our ladies over here that we've been meeting this morning. Let's see who we're coming up on now. Who is this? Well, this, ah. Hi, sweetheart. This is Kalinda again. She was actually on the move. She wanted to find a eucalyptic species that she really preferred. Let's see if we can't get a better vantage point of her. There we go. Hello. So I guess her nose told her that this bundle was better than the last bundle. Yeah. So <laughs> she put her sense of smell to use. We talked about that sense of smell being important for them, not just in food selection, but also um, in finding out where the males are and where the females are. Oh yeah. And sometimes they get, as you can see, very relaxed and they'll kind of recline their bodies, like just chilling, <laughs> just hanging out, eating my gillipus. That's right. It's like the koala equivalent of snacks on the couch, kind of. <laughs> there we yes. go. In the lazy boy. <laughs> In the lazy boy. Absolutely. And this is how they spend a lot of the time of the day, which is why we provide so much eucalyptus for them to find and eat throughout wow. the day. And we've been going back and forth in the girls' yard, and uh, we actually have 10 koalas out here, and nine of those koalas have joeys in the pouch. Wow, so, so we're actually, about to see some babies. Seven of those have joeys in the pouch, because Kalinda here is a little too young to have a joey in the pouch. Right, it's going to be a busy holiday season, so please come and join us. Yeah. And like we said before, the koalas, they're not bears, they're marsupials, correct? Correct, they are not bears. I know, I can see why people would think they're bears, but they live in trees like, uh, you'll see them in trees like bears would be. Those big fuzzy ears make it seem like they could probably be related to a bear, but they are anything but. They are highly specialized marsupials. In fact, a highly specialized marsupial that eats only eucalyptus. I mean, it doesn't get less bear-like than that, I think. <laughs> I agree. And going back to the joeys, about how long do you think until we'll be able to see some of those poking out of the pouches? Uh, the next one will be coming out probably in the next couple of weeks. That would be Mirinda. And then all of the other girls will follow just maybe a couple of weeks. The last koala that will uh, have a joey coming out is gonna be around December. So again, when we have our December lights, that might be an, a great opportunity to see that joey coming out of the pouch. And all of the older joeys too. Yeah, yeah. And everybody loves a Christmas baby. Right? They're Absolutely. So cute. Hello, <laughs> hi there. Well, that doesn't look like people like this. No. Not quite. I'll go back to what I was doing. Uh, do we groom their nails or do any kind of nail clipping for them? Well, it seems like when the specialists weigh the koalas, it's a good opportunity to get a good close look at those nails. Usually they self-maintain the nails, but every now and then they do have to do a little shaping so that they can keep them sharp and, and usable for what they do on a daily basis. Climbing those trees, eating those Just leaves. Like that. There you go. They're so much more agile than I thought they would be. Right? Always oh. a surprise to people. All right. She said bye. Oh yeah, she's like, there's somebody behind you. She's like, where's that other you going to see? There's somebody who wants to take a peek. <laughs> Who's way? this? Hi. You coming to join the party? But don't forget me. And are koalas considered endangered or are they threatened? They are considered threatened right now. Um, but I think as the numbers decrease, we're going to soon be finding them on the endangered species list. Yeah, those, those wildfires were so devastating last year. Such a horrible thing to have happen to these amazing animals and all the wildlife in Australia. 
That's why the conservation work that we do with our partners is so very important. I mean, the first step in knowing how to save them is to know how they use their spaces. So all of those um, programs that we participate in help answer those questions so that we can be prepared to help save these amazing animals. She's a little chonky. <laughs> And does she have a joey in her pouch? She does. She does. So I guess she's earned her chonkiness. Is yeah, she's got think? a little bit of that pregnancy weight. I know. <laughs> like a nice healthy lady should. So when uh, these guys get their weights taken on a weekly basis, like we talked about, sometimes when the koala females lose weight, it's a good indication that they could be entering an estrus cycle. That means that they're receptive for breeding. And I think that these guys have the best um, breeding program ever because they have probably two to three males that have been selected for each female, breeding female, that um, would be an ideal match to keep the genetic population viable. So when the specialists think that there is a female in estrus, they'll start by taking their top selection for genetic diversity. Bachelor number one. Bachelor, Bachelor number, one. number one. To the female, and if she's receptive, they will actually breed. And from that point then, we start a countdown of 32 days? It's between um, 32 and 35 days uh, is when the joey be will be born. Absolutely. And somebody's coming up right behind her, so just so you know, we uh, might have another one visible to us. Oh, wow. So of course, if bachelor number one doesn't make the cut, of course, she swipes left. <laughs> and the specialist might uh, try again with a uh, bachelor number two. <laughs> until she picks her dream man. There you go. Helping to add to that population of koalas. Got a good... Let's see. Oh, oh, we got a talker. She is eating some food. <laughs> she will not be... feel like you're in Australia now. <laughs> you guys just got to hear one of our kookaburras, which is a bird native to Australia. Um, you'll often hear them in the background of um, movie soundtracks as like a jungle animal right. in places that they don't actually right. live. Yes, I think mini Tarzan movie has a kookaburra. Yep. <laughs> what was that? So you can this see is actually mom and daughter. Mom and daughter. So now if she was a male koala at a year and a half, she'd be earning the right to have her own uh, palapa and habitat. But she's a female, so she gets to hang in the harem yard with all the rest of the ladies. Are uh, mom koalas affectionate toward their kids or do they kind of, you know, let them do their own thing once they're weaned off? Uh, they generally let them do their own thing. Uh, it's surprising though that when we do remove a joey from a mom to maybe get a weight on that joey and to um, just make sure that it's in good health. If that joey is making any vocalizations, that mom usually comes down and uh, Colette just came running over. Oh my gosh, I wasn't expecting that, you guys. I just <laughs> I saw this thing either. running out of the corner of my eye and she ran across the ground to this <laughs> other tree. Goodness so, gracious. That just demonstrates what our koalas will do uh, periodically and especially during the evenings is go back and forth between habitats. Um, they generally get along, but occasionally they have little spats because somebody's sitting where they want to sit. And if the food source on the other habitat wasn't what she was really looking for, she may be coming over to this side to see what the selection is over here. Yeah, see if we've got better leaves yep. than they do over there. Exactly. I have known a koala mom or two to be quite tolerant of the joeys, especially as they reach the uh, back young phase. So we start from pouch young and then they start to ride along long back as they get older. And they are so tolerant of them sitting on top of their heads, sitting in front of their faces when they're trying to eat eucalyptus. I think that they have a tolerant gene that I might have missed, but <laughs> yeah, the koala moms don't. They are rather tolerant of their joeys. 
That's amazing. So glad to hear that. Absolutely. <laughs> so are the jellies. <laughs> and just to reiterate one more time, they do only eat eucalyptus, right? They don't eat anything else. That is correct. Their sole uh, food item is eucalyptus. Now there are a number of varieties, varieties of eucalyptus. So that's where that keen sense of smell comes in, where they can select what is the favorite for the day that they'll want to eat. But eucalyptus is their primary source of food. And that also plays into why they do spend so much time sleeping. Eucalyptus is not a food item that a lot of animals can process, right? So anything that takes a lot of energy to process so that it can be turned into um, usable components for the koalas takes a lot of resting so that that transformation can happen so that's why they sleep a lot of the time it's because of the diet that they have eucalyptus isn't particularly nutritionally dense is it not particularly which is why they've got to eat that three pounds or so of yeah of it. have to eat an awful lot of it absolutely and who is this that we're we're looking at right now? We're looking at Kularu right now. Kularu. And I think she wants me to put her food up. Oh yeah. <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll uh, adjust our eucalyptus here. Hopefully we can get it up and nice and straight for her. She'll follow up. Look for those tips. Hi. And so I watching know. the koalas is something that the specialists do when they do this every day so getting their food set up for them in the palapa gives them great up close <laughs> oh yep that's what she wanted viewing of, yeah. what you, want? you can eat it down there but i was gonna put it up for you <laughs> does that look like there? a small brained animal i don't i don't think so, so. <laughs> words can hurt oh. There's another moving too. you see we've got oh. somebody moving and we might get to see a joey that would just be a great start to the weekend. Thanks again, you guys, for joining and for donating. Um, you know, we have some really incredible conservation work that we do with koalas and, and saving them in their natural habitats in Australia. Did she go up? Let's see, she might have. She's this way. All right, let's see. I got to watch my steps, so sorry if this gets shaky. Try to make the habitat for them as possible. Oh man, we have a Joey peeking out. Let's see if I can zoom in so you guys can see that. Do you see those little ears? So there's an animal that we have. That's what we look for. There we go. Those moments where the Joey. Sorry, I'm doing my doing my best. There we go. There's the little face. Hello, little one. <laughs> So Hi. By the time all those other joeys emerge, that one will be bigger, much bigger. Much bigger. Now at this point in time, we don't, I believe, know the gender? Yeah. Not just yet. Do we know our gender of this little guy? Oh, this is a male. Oh, excuse this me. This is a male. Yeah. A little boy. We were able to get a first weight and sex this little guy just a couple of weeks ago. Oh my goodness. So he's been slowly coming out of the pouch, probably at night while the specialists aren't here, where mom feels a little more confident. And now that he's getting older and larger, she's allowing him to come out and spend more time out on her belly. And this is where he's learning what mom is doing. So he'll start mimicking her. When she pulls eucalyptus over, he might try to smell it and eat it. But at this stage, he also needs to get some bacteria in his gut. And to obtain that bacteria before he starts eating these leaves and consuming them, he has to eat a little bit of mom's poop, which is called pap. <laughs> so they have we'll to eat in mom's the mornings poop. And we might see little brown faces, but we're very excited when we see that. That's a milestone for a Joey, and we know that it's okay for them to start eating leaves. And now he's probably been eating pap. We haven't seen any. Um, brown on his face, but that doesn't mean he hasn't been eating it. But he's certainly mimicking what mom's doing. I see him smelling yeah. the leaves, and I think I even saw him reach for some. Yeah. Kind of seems like he's talking himself into it. <laughs> like, all right, here we go. It's time for leaves. That's right. He's got a little time. <laughs> And so you said that they do, they eat pap, which is from mom's 
It's, it's mom's poop. It's mom's poop. It's a very soft feces that the moms start to produce for their babies. We don't know how the joeys know, but they just instinctually know that they have to consume some of this. And once they've consumed it, they can start eating the eucalyptus because they have that bacteria in their gut. Hi. That is so exciting that we get to see him. What a treat this is. Another one of those specialized things about marsupials. Yeah, wow. Koalas, specifically. And Adori is a first time mom and she's been so doting. She's such a good mom. Mm -hmm. Usually when I see her moving about, she makes sure that that Joey's nice and secure. Or when she's sitting, you might actually see that her back feet are kind of staying up so that she takes a little more uh, kind of a crouched position so that Joey's got a nice place to stay safe. But it probably in the coming months, within the next month or so, we're gonna start to see this Joey moving on to her back. And that's um, where we call them back young. And then the Joey will at that point, between eight and nine months, start to maybe sit off of mom. And as they're sitting off of mom, they're learning how to climb, how to eat, how to maneuver. And uh, they're learning how to be a koala. Mm -hmm. Well, she concealed that little Joey from us just for a second, hoping we can get a second peek here. Oh, oh. oh startled. What was that? Let's it was see. a dust. All right. Come on, Mama. So all of those things that Jenny was talking about are what make Omeo koala so special because he missed out on those opportunities. Oh. So our specialists, our neonatal care staff, and veterinary services all had to be that for Omeo. So that was really a milestone for us yeah. to, to have Omeo with us. How amazing. Yes. Yep, and for you guys that missed it, Omeo actually introduced us to our live today. And if you want to see his story, it is available on all of our social channels, our YouTube, and on the Zoo San Diego, the Animal Planet show. His story is over several episodes, so make sure to check that out if you're interested in koalas and the kind of work that we do for them here at San Diego Zoo. Absolutely. The San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance website sdzwa.org will give you all of that information just have to come and visit just got to come see it That's for yourself right. looks like we're getting into nap time now but we might have another opportunity we're going to do some parkour here through the habitat let's see if we can't go find somebody looks like everybody's pretty happy right now pretty content yeah. they received their morning breakfast we always get sleepy after we eat breakfast too. Let's see. Oh, Bonner is so sleepy. Hey, did you get your breakfast this morning? So as you'll see that Wanneroo has already consumed quite a bit of leaf. Oh yeah. So that's why she's probably ready for a nap. Well, she digests it all. You're getting quite the good view. Yeah, wow, she is right there. I love how their little legs stick out like that. So precious. Hello. Hello. Um, can koalas see in color or do we know? Um, I do not know the answer to that question, but I know that their eyesight is not as keen. They do have, as you can see, their pupils are up and down just like a cat. So they have um, really good eyesight at night because koalas are going to be on the move in the evenings. So they can see much better in the evening. Oh, wow. I didn't know that they had pupils up and down. That's kind of hard to see, I think, here. Mm -hmm. And then they've got those noses that make up for that eyesight. Yeah. yeah. And those ears. And, and those the ears. ears. Oh, can't forget those ears. <laughs> yeah. As we just saw with Adori when she heard a noise that she perked up. Hi. She's getting ready for her nap. She, yeah. She's sleepy. She's like, what are you doing? Yeah, she has a Joey in there too. And her Joey was tumbling around in the pouch. Oh. We a lot of movement. So you can see how Jennifer was talking about sitting far apart with the legs. Yeah, she's got a little somebody in there. Couch. You need to be everybody be comfortable. <laughs> you may not see, see my if she'll let us get a peek. Oh. You may not see my Maybe no. not. <laughs> nope, she's, she's protective. Being a good mom. Yes, she is. But as I'm you not can not ready for this Joey to come out here yet. She's like, in a couple of months, you'll be able to see him. Not yet. But like we talked about before, uh, body weights are an indicator for what their status is as far as being reproductively ready. So all of the koalas that we have here at the San Diego Zoo get a body weight every week. Every week, every wow. Every week. 
And because the specialists are here so close, they get an opportunity to keep tabs on the koalas. It's like, where is their pouch movement? What we see? Maybe even get a glimpse of a little hand or a face or a nose emerging from a, a mother's pouch. That's all very important to keeping this population of koalas healthy and sustainable. <laughs> here you are, little tongue out. There she goes. And we can kind of see it here, but can we talk about their hands again? It looks like they have two thumbs. Right, that's what it looks like, right? Because when they live in the trees, those two thumbs help them grip very tightly to the branches that they live in. So the two, it looks like two thumbs. It's two fingers on the inside of their wrist and three fingers on the outside of their wrist. And that really helps when you're gripping around, round things like limbs. She is serving us some looks right now. <laughs> Isn't she? She's pretty good at it. She's in a food coma. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I got all those tender tips. I'm good to go. And I'm comfortable. Yeah, she looks pretty pretty comfortable. Oh yes, pretty the young. child's Look asleep. Look at how this little bum is all settled in this tree. Mm -hmm. They even have, I don't know if you saw when they were leaping through the trees, it's a bit of a little flat spot at the base of their, at the spine. So looks that way. It makes like a little seat for them almost. Oh, they have a built-in seat. Uh-huh. And furry ears. And a bald nose, cat-like eyes. Going back to our original conversation a little bit ago, we talked about how the female koalas choose a male. And so the wildlife care specialists present them with several bachelors to choose from. Um, what happens if they decide they don't like anybody right now? Uh, then we have to get in touch with our geneticist and find bachelor number four, five, and six. You just keep going till she decides to pick and a man. she decides. And sometimes when we pair them up, we find that the females want mate selection is a little difficult for them and they just don't usually or may not prefer their first male so it's nice to have backups with bachelor number two and bachelor number three most of the time though our females do like their first bachelor she's ready for that now <laughs> she is as you can see where she was eating earlier when we first started and uh now she's just sleeping oh Nayani's asleep. That's precious. So like we said, you guys, thank you so much for tuning in today. It is Save the Koala Day and these animals do need our help. I think we should let her go to sleep. Let her go to sleep. That is fine. Who else Good is. night. I think you're going to find as we move about the habitat that a lot of our girls may have had a little snack and are ready for their nap time. A little snack and snooze. This is Nayani. Hi, Nayani. Hello. So one of the important things that we uh, do take uh, into consideration as part of our koala education and conservation program is with this population of koalas we have at the San Diego Zoo, we also try to partner with other um, the zoos around the country, sometimes internationally, that will house koalas from this very population. And with the uh, funds generated from that program, it goes into our conservation for Australian animals, koalas, and uh, the programs that we work with there, and our partners with the Australian government. So any of your purchases, your tickets, any of your donations go toward us being able to provide for these incredible animals um, and for the conservation work that we do both here at home and out in the wild. So we just really appreciate all of your support. Thank you so much. Absolutely. See if we can find any more ladies. They might all be napping. We might have just kind of missed that active time. Everybody's eaten. They're nice and full. Have a meal break. <laughs> so sweet. Okay. Yeah. See if we can walk around. Everybody might another. be. There she is. She's probably looking for which tree she's going to investigate next. It's a hard choice to make. Right. This is the best office ever. Ever. <laughs> Smells like eucalyptus. Got koala. Fresh What's not to like? You get that sense when you come and visit. 
Well, to finish up our live, maybe if we can get permission, could we go see where the eucalyptus is prepped? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. just head on uh, up so that everyone, everyone gets a chance and an opportunity to see where, where we store everything. Yeah. Bye, Wanneroo. Take a nice nap. Bye, Wanneroo. <laughs> take you a nice nap. Well, we talked earlier about the number of species or kinds of eucalyptus that exist. Now, we don't have access to hundreds of species of eucalyptus, but we do have a dedicated horticulture team that collects browse from our farm that we have at the safari park. Gonna go see where all this eucalyptus comes from when we have, what did we say, 31? We have 31 that are eating eucalyptus at right, right now. And uh, soon, by the end of the year, since Niani's the last joey to come out, those joeys are gonna be consuming eucalyptus also. So we're gonna have to increase our supply. Mm -hmm. um, we are very fortunate when we had um, the Australian Outback built in 2013 that we had a very large uh, refrigerator put in because we have many, many miles to be in. And it's a cooler that's designed for like the floral industry. So when the browse is collected from the farm, it comes here and it's deposited into the cooler. That gives it a little bit more of a shelf life for us to use. Yeah. And I open the That is a big fridge. Wow. There are 20 of these barrels that are full of bundles of eucalyptus. And we'll go through probably seven or eight of these every day. Wow. So our horticulture staff has actually delivered for the weekend. So we are hoping that everything that you see here today will get us through till Monday. Do you have any idea how many different types of eucalyptus are in here right now? Uh, if I look in here right now, I can probably say seven. Seven kinds, seven. wow, that's yeah. incredible. And as you probably will see, the leaves do look different. So, we've got some long leaves. Yeah, all different types some of leaves. Some leaves. Wow. And it smells amazing in here, don't you agree? Oh, it smells fantastic. I feel like I'm in a spa. Uh -huh. Nice and cool. You'll find me in here on a hot summer day. Wow. Those tender tips we were talking about yeah. that the koalas love. That will be gone tomorrow. It'll be one happy koala. Wow. It's really cool if you come to visit the koalas at the zoo. You can see through the windows when you enter the koala Australian outback area what the cooler has in it so you can see yourself and when you do come to the zoo this whole area was designed so that you could not only come in and see the you put with this as you pass by but you might even actually see uh one of the wildlife care specialists preparing those very bundles that you saw the girls enjoying out in the yard and that is something that takes a lot of time and i can tell you it takes a lot of expertise not only one to identify the species, but be able to provide three to four of them to each of those 31 koalas that we have here at the San Diego Zoo. So when you come and see them, 